79 Mana Road we lived on. That's where we lived when I was 13. And then when I was 14 and a half, Sal was born. But I was the oldest. When he, did, when he was born, I more or less brought him up, you know. Peter Sutcliffe, the notorious serial killer, was born on the 2nd of June 1946 in Bingley, a market town situated on the outskirts of Bradford, West Yorkshire. He was raised in a working class family by his parents, John William Sutcliffe and Kathleen Francis Coonan, who hailed from Connemara in Ireland. While Kathleen was a Roman Catholic, John was an active member of the choir at the local Anglican church. Well, my first attack wasn't until 1969. It was that clumsy attack with the shock with the pebbles in, you know. You can press the hardest to rope and exactly the same thing to somebody else. But it was a shock, you know. You wouldn't press the hardest. He wasn't injured, you know. The shock burst and all the pebbles went over some cars. Somebody saw it and took the number plate when I got into his car, you know. He didn't press the hardest, you see. But that shows that it was just the first attack, very amateurish, and I had to be more careful and more specific after that. Their children were raised in their mother's Catholic faith, and Sutcliffe briefly served as an altar boy. Sutcliffe was a premature baby having to spend two weeks in hospital, and his mother was a victim of domestic abuse, making it likely she struggled through her pregnancy under great emotional stress. Cliff is a very complex, dangerous man with a great deal of deviousness and manipulation. Sutcliffe knows perfectly well what he's doing almost all the time. The Yorkshire Ripper is probably the most prolific serial murderer Britain has seen and will see ever. Women throughout Yorkshire were terrified to go out at night. Sutcliffe's warped attitude towards working girls and sex led him to slaughter 13 women in Northern England. The first reports of him being called the Yorkshire Ripper weren't actually to do with specific injuries of the victims, but it was to do with the similarity of Jack the Ripper targeting prostitutes. In Leeds in October 1975, luck ran out for Ripper victim number one. Body identified as that of 28-year-old divorcee Wilma McCann, found 150 yards from the council house where she'd lived with her four children. The yeah. first one I actually killed was in 1975. Wilma McCann was the first one. That necessarily, that's making love to dead people or something, you know? Yeah, it says the Yorkshire Ripper was a necrophiliac who masturbated over corpses and got sexual kicks from the bodies. No one even dream of it, you know. No. What's the point? These people are really sick. There's nothing sexual in my crimes. They just, they just make you sick. These people are sick. They are really sick themselves to write stuff like that, you know. They think they can make money and sell books. That's all they're interested in. They don't get a damn about the truth. He was out boozing or playing football or rugby or something. He was never in, really. He never had a spare minute from coming home from work. He was back out again, you know. Ignored the family, really. I had some really bad memories. We all did of my dad, you know. Could be really nasty and drunk. He was a womanizer. Sutcliffe was the elder of six children and had a troubled home life. His mother, Kathleen, was regularly abused by his alcoholic father, John Sutcliffe. John hated his wife. She was a bitch, and the least said about her, the better, John said. After another nine weeks came Ripper victim number five. This time it was 16-year-old shop assistant Jane MacDonald, mistaken for a prostitute when she took a shortcut home from a disco through the red light area of Leeds. Did you have a lot of regrets when you killed Jane MacDonald, a 16-year-old? Yes, I did, yeah. It's the wrong place at the wrong time. Sadly, you know. This time it was 16-year-old shop assistant Jane MacDonald, mistaken for a prostitute 
when she took a shortcut home from a disco through the red light area of Leeds. I didn't believe that she wasn't a prostitute. I thought she was in the red light area at the time of night, you know, walking slowly in that, you know. And there were two cars were flashing the lights out as well, you know, so. What was she doing at half past one in the morning, the prostitute earlier? And I didn't know how old she was, I had no idea, you know. Until this? I did feel it later on when I, when I, when I convinced myself that uh, she hadn't been a prostitute, you know. Sutcliffe's father was an alcoholic who once smashed a beer glass over Sutcliffe's head for sitting in his chair at the Christmas table when he was just five years old. Peter Sutcliffe had spent most of his life this way, passed over, unnoticed. He was born on June 2, 1946, the oldest of John and Kathleen Sutcliffe's six children. He was born into a, a blue-collar household in a place called Bingley in North Yorkshire, uh, born to, I would have said, a fairly prosperous family in the sense that they all had jobs, uh, they were Catholics, they re went to church regularly. It was a typical Yorkshire household. Peter's father John ruled the family with a firm hand. He had little time for his son, who was small and timid. As a result, Sutcliffe idolised his mother but his father would frequently dismiss the slightly built Peter as a wimp, always hanging from his mother's apron strings, a mummy's boy. Sutcliffe's mother often lavished attention on her son and was to become seen by Peter as perfect. This wasn't just five victims in the East End, as Jack the Ripper was. This was many, many victims. Somewhere near here lives the killer they call the Yorkshire Ripper. His five-year career of killing began in the red-light district of Chapeltown. Peter was quiet, shy and awkward. He was skinny and scrawny and didn't live up to his father's expectations. And it's thought that this planted a seed of shame in Peter Sutcliffe that would shape the rest of his life. At the Yorkshire Incident Rooms, there is also concern about two more prostitutes missing from their usual haunts in Leeds. Two more people to keep tabs on in Britain's longest-running, fully active murder inquiry. So far, police have interviewed no less than 50,000 people, taken 12,000 statements. And still, the police can't get all the help they need from the people who inhabit the twilight world of prostitution. Tracy Brown is one of these surviving victims. Down. She didn't look uh, 16, she looked about 19 or 20, you know, she all dressed up. She was walking slowly up this lane, I thought, oh, you know, um, she, she's probably one of these prostitutes. Because I had in my mind that there were shows in mostly full of prostitutes, you know. I hit her with a branch or something, threw her over a wall. And I climbed over the wall and I was, I was, I was thinking of bumping her off, and this boy said, stop, stop, it's a mistake. I said, oh, I said, oh, I'm sorry, you'll be all right, I'm going now, I'm not coming back, I'm going now, you'll be okay. I went down to my car, then a car came up the, up the road, and it, I saw it stop at the top of the road, so she must have climbed over the wall, and they took her home, you know. She can't have been seriously injured, because she would have still been behind the wall, you know. I've been watching, uh, watch the rest of that documentary about you. Do you think it was fair or was it biased? Well, did you attack that Marcella Claxton, a black girl? Yeah. Yeah, because they said that they didn't know whether to believe her or not. So it was you. Yeah. John would also whip his children with a belt as a form of punishment. Sutcliffe's siblings later described their father as a monster. And according to Sutcliffe's younger brother, the atmosphere in our house would change as soon as he walked through the door. His father, John Sutcliffe, was very flamboyant. 
He wasn't home often, but when he was, some of his children were frightened of him. He was very much a violent bully to his wife. He had many affairs and he bragged about them to his sons. The Ripper was mobile. Nobody really knew what he looked like. And it was a real nationwide fear. And every time the news was on, there would be another press conference. And you really had this feeling that out there somewhere was the Ripper and he was one step ahead of the police. Detectives suspected one man. Now, five years later, the death toll has reached 13, each death bringing grief and tragedy to the victim's family. At school, Peter was an unremarkable student and reportedly a loner. And when he joined St. Joseph's Catholic School, he was relentlessly bullied for his skinny legs. He left school without any qualifications. I went back to school and kicked the seven shades of shit out of that bully that was bullying me. I had enough of it and uh, I went back to school as angry as anybody could be, you know. And I went up to him and kicked him and smacked him in the face and he fell over and I, and I kicked him again, you know. And uh, the headmaster wanted to know what it was all about and I said that's why I've been wagging school for that prat. I said, but I'm not putting up with it any longer. Kept clear of me after that. I really sat myself up. There was one big fella picking on a mate of mine once and I just grabbed hold of him and lifted him right up over my head and he, he said, put me down, put me down. He was like a little kid. It was amazing that I could do that, trained a few times a week. We drew on the walls in the discotheque, gravestones and skull and crossbones and stuff and wrote the Grave Diggers Union and all our names written on, on the translucent bright green wall, you know, I'd go there every week. Peter learned how to view and treat women from the hands of his father. One time John Sutcliffe spotted Kathleen Sutcliffe talking to two men in a pub. All she was doing was talking to them and John walked over to her and slapped her straight across the face. With several siblings and his abusive father crammed into a small working class house, his home life was also chaotic. If you overstepped the mark, as Kathleen did in John Sutcliffe's eyes, you were rapidly, violently and brutally brought back to your place. Peter was probably under pressure to be more macho than he naturally was. So here we have the altar boy, which Peter was, and a father saying that this is what you do to be a man. So Peter saw women very much as either Madonnas or whores. And this was before the internet age. This was before texting and social media could fuel a panic. This was generated by TV and newspapers alone. This is the day Jacqueline Hill would have come home for Christmas with her family. Instead, they wept over her coffin. It's just over a month since she became the 13th victim of the Yorkshire Ripper. The Ripper seemed to favour working girls. Well, everything you can for your mum, bless her, you know. When they've gone, you've lost them then, haven't you? So you often wish, I wish I'd said this or done that too late once they've gone. Because, I mean, they bring you up and everything, don't they? Feed you, clothe you, get you to school and everything, you know. And then uh, some people don't care about the parents' condition or whatever, you know. They just ignore them altogether. And, uh, it's not right, is it? But, like, it's important to... Do as much as you can. You only get one set of parents, don't you? Sutcliffe's awkward demeanour as a child manifested itself into a dysfunctional adulthood, demonstrated by his early career choices. There was new nannyness with the schizophrenia. After all, the prosecution was on my side and the defence, the doctors, and it's their opinions that should count, you know. Because they returned it. Who's he to turn it over? Because they had the power to do it. They're a judge, just an ignorant slob, you know. I thought some, uh, some of the lads were having a bit of fun at first. I got up and looked round, I couldn't see anybody. Nobody hiding in the bushes in the distance or behind any gravestones. And I walked up the slope and I heard it coming directly. 
It was like in a wonderland, you know, like a miracle happening. It's on this grave and it said, uh, Bronislaw Zapolsky. I always remember that. I was awestruck. It was like an echoey voice, echoing, superimposed upon itself. In 1970, Suckley's father posed as his wife's lover in order to lure her to a hotel and took Suckcliffe and two of his siblings to witness him expose her infidelity. When Kathleen arrived, Sutcliffe's father pulled out a negligee from his mother's purse as the children watched. The incident in the hotel is absolutely the most significant trauma to Peter of what goes on to happen. He had some kind of mission, if you like, against prostitutes, against uh, females in general. He would pick on vulnerable, isolated females. Some believe there were far more murders than 13. There is some suggestion that he killed more, but we know he killed at least 13, and then he injured at least another seven. I have always believed that Sutcliffe killed and attacked long before he started the, the famous five-year spree. Even the perfect women have become distorted. Women will let you down. Women will lie. Women will cheat and are not to be respected. John later said, I remember Peter was standing there. He was shook, rigid. He had a look on his face like an animal, it were. I think it may have turned his mind. In 1965, he put all my helmet and knocked my head in at one side. Yeah. Really bad concussion I had. I was unconscious for two days, you know. Oh, yeah. I should have come to hospital, really. I woke up two days later and my mum said, Are you all right? She said, I was thinking of calling an ambulance. You didn't, I couldn't wake you up. It was a horrible thing to do, especially as John wasn't whiter than white. And it's thought it shattered Peter's image of his mother as a Madonna. Clearly, this had a huge psychological impact on Sutcliffe. He left school at 15 and began a series of menial jobs, including a lorry driver and a, and a grave digger at Bingley Cemetery, something his colleagues reported he enjoyed a little bit too much, even volunteering to wash corpses as overtime. What is known for sure is that Sutcliffe's attacks were brutal, vicious and primitive. Sutcliffe's weapon of choice was a ball-peen hammer. He would often also have chisels or knives. One of his most common methods that he's used was to get behind his victim at night, in the dark, in an isolated space, and hit them on the back of the head with the hammer. He would then um, use a utensil such as a screwdriver or a knife that's very long, he would disembowel them. He would do various things with their intestines and some of their in injuries that he actually did inflict ultimately are not generally reported. Peter became obsessed with death and dead bodies and stories were told of grave robbings etc. Sutcliffe began to steal things off the corpses Clearly, he wasn't scared of the dead, so he pretty much became desensitised to death and corpses. However, he didn't stay in this role for long. After drifting from job to job, he eventually trained as a HGV driver in 1975 when he was 29 years old. I didn't like it. Because he used to load the tyres on the trailer by hand and they were full of water. And you had all the filthy water sloshing over you as you threw them up onto the truck. Big lorry tyres as well, most of them. On many of his attacks, Sutcliffe wore a modified pair of overalls. These were overall trousers that he wore, which had the crotch cut out, which meant that he could have sex with a victim at very short notice 
without having to take off his trousers and his underwear. What is far less knowable is the motivation of Sutcliffe. How could any human be capable of such sustained barbarism? In his late adolescence, he began to develop a penchant for voyeurism, spying on sex workers between his shift work and using their other services frequently. Sutcliffe reportedly hired prostitutes as a young man, and it's been speculated that he had a bad experience during which he was conned out of money by a prostitute and her pimp. Sutcliffe met 16-year-old Sonia Zerzma, the daughter of a Czech refugees, on the 14th of February 1967 at the Royal Standard Pub on Manningham Lane in Bradford's Red Light District. They married on the 10th of August 1974. Peter Sutcliffe's murders were motivated by his own perverse sense of sex. Peter Sutcliffe was paraphilic. His sexuality had to involve sadism, rape, an initial attraction towards prostitutes and an obvious idea that they were the less than dead, that they were not going to be noticed, less than a normal person would be noticed if they went missing. His wife suffered several miscarriages over the following few years and the couple were subsequently informed that she would not be able to have children. Because of this, Sonia went back to her studies to become a primary school teacher. I couldn't confide in anybody, my mother or Sonia or anybody, between me and God. I caught her outside college in Bradford at Hilter, a bit surprised to see me, and I walked her home and I was asking her about this person that gave her a lift, and she, she wouldn't tell me anything because she thought, she thought, why don't I trust her, you know? And I told her that Mick had seen her two or three days before it, going on so bingly in the car. I mean, I was <coughs> really having a go at her, you know, to find out what was going on. And she wouldn't answer. So I thought there was something fishy. She would just, uh, couldn't believe that I'd, I'd doubt her, you know, because she expected me to trust her, you see. And it was like a bull in a china shop. I should have been a bit more casual about it. So that's what led to me uh, uh, thinking she'd been with somebody and, and uh, it led me to pick a prostitute up in the first place. Nighttime in Northern England in the late 1970s, a dangerous time for women. From 1975 to 1980, 13 women were murdered by the depraved man who came to be dubbed the Yorkshire Ripper. Four of the five first victims were prostitutes, leading to some complacency in the general community. But on the 25th of June 1977, 16-year-old supermarket worker Jane MacDonald was murdered in Chapel Town, a crime that struck fear into the heart of every woman living in the city. The Ripper would take his victims by surprise, bludgeoning them in the head with a hammer, then slashing them across the stomach and back with a knife before sexually assaulting them. Huge resources were poured into the police investigation, but the massive amounts of information being generated also proved to be its undoing. With more than 10,000 possible leads filed on index cards, police did not have an effective way of cross-checking information. Police conducted thousands of interviews. One man dragged into the net was an apparently mild-mannered lorry driver, Peter Sutcliffe. Two years before their marriage, Sonia was diagnosed and treated for paranoid schizophrenia. She would often be subject to fits of rage and would treat Sutcliffe like a naughty little schoolboy, while her husband had to even occasionally contain her physically by pinning her arms to her side during her common, unprovoked outbursts of rage. Sutcliffe himself was stopped in the red light district. Police officers didn't pay him much attention because he didn't have a weird side accent, he had a Yorkshire accent, and he was able to go. And while the police were busy looking in that direction, Sutcliffe was over there killing more and more victims. The police came in for a lot of criticism during the Ripper manhunt. 
not least because they actually interviewed Sutcliffe on a number of occasions. But in the pre-computer age, they were simply overwhelmed. They didn't have the technology, they didn't have the initial resources and manpower that they needed. You cannot possibly cross-reference everything physically and mentally. It has to be done by computers. He came up nine times and the police got criticised for that. But they were interviewing thousands and thousands of suspects. They were also under intense pressure from the local authority, from Parliament, to solve this, to find the Ripper. You can't just let this go on. Clearly lessons were learned. The Home Office knew that they needed to bring in a computerised system to manage the flow of this information. It half changed my mind. I don't want to. Don't want to go through with it. So she said, "All right. Uh, well, uh, you know, it'll still cost you." I said, "I don't mind," uh, but I felt more sort of resentful than ever. Uh, then I felt really bad about um, the situation. I was gonna intending just to have sex with somebody so that I wouldn't be blaming Sonia all the time. And uh, I got back home and I was got depression again. And then the voice came for the second time. Well, it, I'd been talking, saying things good for about two years, but this, this time it was giving me advice that wasn't really good, saying that there's a problem in society. Don't you realise why you've had the good advice for two years? It's all been leading up to this. You've got a mission to go on and get rid of these people. So that's how it all started, turned from good advice to bad. So that's when I started on the first time. A cat um, with a, a sock and a load of pebbles in it and I hit one on the head. It was a clumsy attack, proving it was my first attempt. Because it, it, a sock burst and the gravel flew out all over some parked cars. Just saw that she was a prostitute and just... Uh, it's perfectly attacked. reasonable to believe that Sonia Sutcliffe had no idea what, what her husband was doing because he had a job where he moved around a lot, where he was driving around a lot, and there was no mobile phone for him to keep in touch Finally, after thousands of police hours spent on one of the biggest manhunts ever seen, after the years of fear, of dead ends, of hoaxes, Peter Sutcliffe was apprehended in the most mundane circumstance. A police force unable to halt a flood of murders. They knew that there was a man out there who was hating prostitutes and was stalking them and killing them. No woman is safe whilst he's a boat. This is the story of the Yorkshire Ripper. Killing prostitutes became an obsession with me. He went out prepared to do evil, and he did do evil. Her relationship with her husband was later characterised as domineering. When her husband was found guilty of the murder of multiple women in 1981, Sonia remained married to him and continued to live in their Bradford matrimonial home. They separated around 1989 and divorced in July 1994. How come you were in a place like that when you're under age? You said they should have gone to the uh, ballet or the opera, one or the other, and they showed the dad the tickets to go, and so I let them go out. They went round the pubs and discotheques instead. She took with me for many, many years, though, before she even thought of... Uh, a uh, separation and all credit to her and then even after that when I suggested she find somebody else she still keeps coming to see me so it's really, she really must have uh, loved me a lot most women would have just uh, washed their hands of somebody but she knew me so well personality and that that she couldn't let go you know? the terror across Yorkshire was intense Many women stayed home after dark, though there were plenty who had no choice but to venture out. The murder victim was identified tonight as 20-year-old Jacqueline Hill, a student who had been living in the Headingley area of the city. Miss Hill's body was found on waste ground near a shopping centre late this morning. There has therefore been inevitable speculation that she may be the 13th victim of the Yorkshire Ripper. And still detectives were no nearer to identifying the Ripper. Even those closest to Sutcliffe had no idea. People at work thought he was chatty, thought he was Jack the Lad. He wasn't seen as being an abnormal 
loner. He wasn't seen as being a weirdo or someone strange. Nobody suspected him. He was a very accomplished liar, a very accomplished manipulator of the police, and a very accomplished manipulator of women, including, I suspect, his wife, Sonia. Barbara Jones, a journalist who had many conversations with Sonia, described her as the most irritating, strangest, coldest person I've ever met. She is so incredibly prickly and demanding. Until the summer of 1975, Peter Sutcliffe had led an apparently unremarkable working-class life. He was a truck driver who frequented neighborhood pubs and had a few minor run-ins with the law. Yet years of rage and fears of inadequacy had built up inside him, feelings that were about to boil over. It was my intention to find a prostitute and make it one more, one less. Peter Sutcliffe was a disturbed man whose marriage to Sonia Zerma also triggered off a hatred for females, which saw him embark on a series of sex attacks on respectable women less than one year into their marriage. They are on the lookout for a man who has terrorised Northern England for five years, a man known as the Yorkshire Ripper. Like his namesake Jack the Ripper, who slaughtered five women in 1888, the Yorkshire killer has preyed on prostitutes. He would approach her from behind, carrying a hammer, usually a ball pain hammer. He would strike them about the head several times, and usually began stabbing his victims and slashing at them uh, with a knife or a sharpened screwdriver. Sutcliffe's assaults, followed by masturbation at the scene, started with a series of horrific murders of prostitutes in Leeds and Bradford red light areas by a cunning maniac who was dubbed the Yorkshire Ripper. I thought she was a prostitute at first, walking slowly and, that, and looking round. When I hit her on the head, and it, it just it didn't knock her out, it was only a stick. And I threw her over a wall and said, you'll be okay, I'm going. Because I, I, I realised that uh, it, she wasn't a prostitute. She, was, uh, she seemed fairly young, but I didn't know how young she was. I heard the, the voice say, no, no, it's a mistake. Stop, stop. So I just said, oh, you'll be all right, I'm going now, and that was it. Peter William Sutcliffe, also known as Peter Coonan, was an English serial killer who was convicted of murdering at least 13 women and attempting to murder at least seven others between 1975 and 1980. He was dubbed in the press reports as the Yorkshire Ripper, an allusion to the Victorian serial killer Jack the Ripper. I hate that title, but it didn't apply, it was just a fantasy a nickname that to get the imaginations going. <laughs> Saw me attack her through the bedroom window, shouted something out, but it was dark, you see. So I, I thought, well, I'll scarp her, and I, I, I went down this snicket, and he went down the snicket, and went across the road and knocked on the door. He must have thought I'd gone into a house there, but I didn't, you know. I couldn't let him identify me. He was sentenced to 20 concurrent sentences of life imprisonment, which were converted to a whole life order in 2010. Two of Sutcliffe's murders took place in Manchester. All the others were in West Yorkshire. Criminal psychologist Dr David Holmes characterised Sutcliffe as being an extremely callous, sexually sadistic serial killer. January 2nd, 1981, just after 10pm, a cold night in Sheffield, England, 
Sergeant Bob Ring and his partner spot a car parked in a driveway near the city's red light district. Police from forces all over the north saturated the red light areas where prostitutes operated and sent in millions of car numbers for storage on computers. Sutcliffe's car alone was spotted 60 times. After three separate sightings, he was taken in for questioning. That meant he'd been interviewed nine times by the police. But always, he was either loosely alibied by his wife, Sonia, or he had some equally plausible excuse. But perhaps the main reason he got away with it for so long was because the police leading the hunt put great emphasis on the tape recording they'd received. I'm Jack. I see you are still having no look catching me. I have the greatest respect for you, George. But Lord, you are no near catching me now than four years ago when I started. The tape, with its strong northeast accent, was of course, as we now know, a hoax. And it sent everybody off looking for clues in quite the wrong direction. They can't be much good, can they? Suckler's friend Trevor Birdsell, who'd long suspected that Suckler might be the Ripper, says he discounted the idea just because his friend hadn't got a Geordie accent. In the end, Suckliffe was caught quite by chance. He'd put false number plates on his car to go out once more looking for a prostitute to kill. When the plates were checked and the police finally found some of his weapons, he confessed. Once he'd admitted he was the Yorkshire Ripper, Suckliffe took over 15 hours to tell the police the rest of his story. A story of 13 killings, seven ferocious attacks, and a gruesome game of hide-and-seek with the police that lasted for six long and terrifying years. When they caught me, you know, they shouldn't have let me go for a piece, because I didn't want the people to just wanted to hide the stuff, you know. Did you hide some in the police station as well? Uh, I uh, died. Oh, they're idiots, you know, I just said, I'm going to go to the toilet, so I didn't even hurt me before I went. The fucking cabinet at the top, you know, where the ball cock is. But they found it later on. Why did you leave the car, said the detective? To relieve myself, said Sutcliffe. I think it was for another purpose, said the detective. I think you're leading up to the Yorkshire Ripper, said Sutcliffe. What about the Yorkshire Ripper, said the detective. Well, said Sutcliffe, it's me. He is being questioned in relation to the Yorkshire Ripper murders. Why? Because I just, uh, I felt, oh, you know, it's just, uh, we're all on too much pain all the time, you know. Yeah, did you think that because they found the stuff, the game was up? More or less, yeah. Absolutely. How did you feel when you got arrested? Were you relieved, do you think? I was, when I finally told them it was me, you know? Yeah. You got off my shoulders, you know? Right. It was a big relief. Went to an end, and I hoped it would, you know? It's the first time in this week of history that I've done, the judges overturned the unanimous doctors thing, you know. Yeah. It was obviously biased. I should have appealed against the judge being biased in the first place, you know. Unanimous that it was schizophrenia. Anyway, he's long, he's long dead now, you know. I'm, I'm as good as any prisoner. I, I never thought any trouble. I've, uh, I've been a model prisoner in the... Uh, for all these years, you know. They yeah. used to put they said it's a mental illness, you can come to terms with it and deal yeah. with it, you know. Which is what I've already done. I'm they, totally sorted, you realized know? they might finally have the right man when they discovered a knife hidden in the police station toilet and a hammer and rope at the scene of his arrest. Confronted with this evidence, Sutcliffe calmly confessed to the murders. Then Sutcliffe calmly confesses telling police who he killed, how he did it, and why he could not stop. I'd been taken over by this urge to kill, and I couldn't fight him. His tale of murder and butchery was likely a mixture of fact and fantasy. 
Sutcliffe is a very manipulative, uh, psychopathic liar. Though he looked harmless, Sutcliffe's 33-page confession is a dark journey through the mind of a merciless killer. He was just Mr. Ordinary. They're the guy next door, they're the guy on the bus, they're the man on the train. And they look just like us and they sound just like us until one day we discover that they are the epitome we of evil. only caught him by, by chance. He was in a car with fake number plates. They phone the control room, the control room says, yes, the car's stolen. They realize that false number plates have been put on it. And he had a working girl with him in the car. They got him out for a chat and Sutcliffe said, I need to go and take a leak. And he went over to take a wee behind a bin. And while he was there, he ditched his hammer and a chisel. And it was only because that police officer afterwards thought, I let him out of my sight for two minutes. And the police officer went back behind the bin and found the stuff Sutcliffe had dumped. Sutcliffe was subsequently taken to the West Yorkshire Police Headquarters. After two days of intense questioning, he suddenly declared he was the Ripper. There was no way he could deny the crimes. He would be tied to them forensically very easily. I think he'd got to the point when he knew, one way or another, even subliminally, that he was very unlikely to get away with it again. And let's deal with it now. And so he rapidly, and I do mean very rapidly, within about 24 hours, starts what became the most extraordinary series of confessions to 13 murders and seven attempted murders of women. Almost chapter and verse. He admitted his guilt, of course, with diminished responsibility, and that's where the element of psychiatry and the law would clash. How much of Sutcliffe was responsible for what he did and how much was not responsible. Several weeks after confessing to the murders, Sutcliffe claimed that he heard the voice of God telling him to rid the world of harlots. Sutcliffe said today that his mission to kill began here, Bingley Cemetery, where as a teenager he worked as a grave digger. It was something I felt was wonderful. I believed then and now that it was the voice of God. I was standing in an open grave taking a rest from digging. I heard a voice similar to a human voice but with the words mixed up. In the years to come Sutcliffe came to have received hundreds of messages urging him to continue killing. One of the things that you would have is, in schizophrenia, you would expect to have hallucinations and command hallucinations, some voice in your head telling you to go and do something. His claim to have slaughtered women for God at his trial raised a huge question mark about his sanity. He suddenly started to argue that, oh, far from being a bad person, he was a mad person. He was a paranoid schizophrenic and that uh, he couldn't possibly be uh, tried as a sane man because he was completely mad. Sheffield police pull behind the parked car and notice a man and woman in the front seat. He parked his car in such a way that the local police officer noticed this and was suspicious about it. They approach cautiously and quickly recognize the woman as a local prostitute. The driver has dark hair and a full beard. He claims the woman is his girlfriend, but the police don't believe him. The young officer checked the registration plate with the police national computer and discovered that the car and the plate were different. The man is identified as Peter Sutcliffe and is taken in for questioning. Over the next two days, he is subjected to intense interrogation and confronted with incriminating evidence. In January 1981, police got a break when they arrested Sutcliffe for driving a car with false number plates. Because he was in the car with a prostitute and he fitted many of the characteristics of the killer, including a gap between his front teeth, Sutcliffe was held for questioning.
suddenly the atmosphere at the Old Bailey became charged with expectancy. Boxes of documents were carried inside. Police muttered urgently into their radios, and then at exactly 9.36, the wail of police sirens heralded the arrival of the man who has become known simply as the Ripper. As the armoured van disappeared beneath the heavy studded portcullis of Newgate Street down the ramp to the cells, the crowd was exceptionally silent. Minutes later, Peter William Sutcliffe was in the dock pleading diminished responsibility. After the hearing, Anna Rogulski, a Yorkshire woman of 39 whom Sutcliffe had admitted trying to murder, was led from the court, apparently in tears, to an office nearby. And then it was all over. Peter Sutcliffe returned to Brixton the way he had come, under heavy guard, and there he will stay until the court resumes next Tuesday. Sam Hall, News at 10 at the Old Bailey. On the night you were arrested, were you going to attack the girl you were with? Of course I was, that was the whole point. Didn't pick him up for any other reason. So you were on a mission that night? Yeah. They had caught the Yorkshire Ripper. During a night of questioning by Ripper Squad detectives, Sutcliffe never cracked. Then one of the arresting officers had a hunch. He remembered that Sutcliffe had left the car to relieve himself while being questioned. He returned to the scene. It was now 24 hours later. And there, lying in the bushes, he found a hammer and a knife hidden. The jury of six men and six women took their places. They heard the Attorney General, Sir Michael Havers, say they had one decision to make. Was Peter Sutcliffe a schizophrenic, or is he a cunning, sadistic killer who's invented his madness in the hope of winning a lighter sentence? I agree with their definition that he was paranoid schizophrenic. I've been fortunate enough to talk to three out of the four psychiatrists that interviewed him, and they all four of them agreed that he was a paranoid schizophrenic. We do need to remember that psychiatry is not an exact science. There's an element of subjective opinion in diagnoses. He clearly wasn't normal, wasn't healthy, but back in, in, the, in the 70s, paranoid schizophrenia was a go-to diagnosis. A modern-day Sutcliffe would be diagnosed as having some kind of psychopathic personality disorder. The problem is, says the Attorney General, that none of this was told by Sutcliffe to the police in a very lengthy interview he gave them. He simply said, I have these urges to kill. This could be believed, this could be dismissed. Unfortunately, many killers go for this kind of defence. The, the idea that for every kind of crooked act, there is a crooked molecule within my brain, so it is not my fault. Finally, the jury decides. In court, he pleaded not guilty to murder on the grounds of insanity, claiming God invested me with the means to kill prostitutes. Perhaps he's just put me in jail to give me a rest. The prostitutes are still there, and my mission is only partially fulfilled. Perhaps another is ready to take my place. But the prosecution revealed that he told his wife, Sonia, I did it all. I expect 30 years in prison. But if I convince people I'm mad, I will only do 10 years in the loony bin. Sutcliffe's family was shattered. You've had to come to terms with the fact that your son is the Yorkshire Ripper. Oh, naturally we had to come to terms with that, yes. And it's been a dreadful, traumatic thing to have to do.
So Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper, is a mass murderer. The jury of six men and six women took nearly six hours to reach their verdict. As each of the 13 women's names was read out, the answer was the same. By a majority of 10 to 2, guilty of murder on all charges. Outside, the crowds who'd waited so long for a verdict were delighted. They unashamedly rejoiced at the news that Sutcliffe was to spend at least 30 years behind bars. But for West Yorkshire Police, it's the end of a nightmare which began five years ago. Even in jail, Sutcliffe continued with his claims of insanity. But the ever-devious and manipulative Sutcliffe was never going to give up. So he convinces, first of all, the prison authorities and then a number of distinguished psychiatrists that he is indeed a paranoid schizophrenic and he shouldn't be in an ordinary prison, but he should indeed have special treatment in Broadmoor Special Hospital, which he duly gets. After over 30 years of life in a secure hospital, psychiatrists determined that Sutcliffe is now mentally fit to be returned to prison, and on the 24th of August 2016 he was transferred to HMP Frankland in Durham. Shortly after he'd given evidence, Sutcliffe was taken out of the court and out of the courthouse. He was bundled into a yellow prison van escorted by two police cars, photographers struggling to take pictures. I can't see him sending you back to prison, me. I just can't see it. Oh, with my eyesight failing and diabetes, heart and uh, going blind, you know. Yeah. I feel so worried about me. Why does he want to send me back to prison, you know? It seems to me like they just want me off their hands. Also tonight, the Yorkshire Ripper's no longer mentally ill and could be back in prison after 31 years in Broadmoor. Oh, I'm doing well. Uh, there's a lot of good lads here. Getting on well with everybody. Um, and there's going to be coffee and tea and stamps and stuff, you know. Oh, wait, so it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be? Oh, no, it's a lot better than Broadmoor. I only came around to my cell the other day and asked me if I could go in the tub of the... Uh, Quality street that I've got, ready for Christmas. Right. It's around quick, doesn't it? Yeah. You used to dress it permanently with minister from them. Not to even mind them doing that. No. Not if they're having a sex in. We have a pair of tips as well, you know? Right. <laughs> yeah. There's so much of that going on, there's some filthy sobs in here, you know, the, you know, Bulgaria and all that sort of thing going on, you know. It's against the Bible preaching and everything, you know. Suck. I'm just sick sometimes, you know, with all these years on the inside. My 40th year on 3rd of January. Mm -hmm. Enough for anybody, really, you know. There'd be a model citizen out there, you know. If I get that squashed, that all I've Yeah. I'll, I'll be out on parole, so that's the biggest hunt, really. Just a night for us, really. I was ringing his solicitor and doing work with that. But yeah, he thought I'd get out. 40 years ago, I mean, we should have a bit of fun packing after such a long sentence. Yeah. Well over more than half my life I've been in charge, yeah. you know. Ridiculous, really. Oh, yeah. Especially when they know how I feel, you know, uh, how regretful I am and yeah. everything, you know. I wouldn't have a fly if I was outside, oh, you know. Yeah. I've changed completely my beliefs and everything has changed, you know. But try and tell them to these crickets, oh, you haven't done your psychology, oh, you pathetic. I'm lying there on a cold floor, so I'll just in the morning till half past six in the morning. Five minutes, yeah, because you can't do nothing about this plastic, it's first of all, it's massive, it's a big dark thing there, it's all right. So I get out of bed and I just go foot on the floor and I can't get it. I was up all night walking back and forth in my cell, I couldn't lie down. Oh dear. It's like being in hell, you know. Especially if you with the thing that you always do. Oh, he died. Did you say no then? 
Yeah. The decision to declare Sutcliffe mentally well enough to leave this high security hospital needs to be rubber stamped by the Justice Secretary. Sutcliffe is one of the most depraved, dangerous, devilishly evil men. He is simply disgraceful. I hope we never see another killer of his ilk terrorise the nation, but the legacy, I think, lives on much longer than any other serial murder we've seen. Good evening, one of Britain's most notorious murderers who took the lives of 13 women during his reign of terror thought he may one day walk free. Today, a judge told Peter Sutcliffe in no uncertain terms that will never happen and he will die in jail. He started killing prostitutes, but his victims would include students and a Sunday school teacher. 13 women died, others survived with terrible injuries. Today, their families expressed relief that he'll never be free. Dismissing the case for release, Mr. Justice Mitting said, apart from a terrorist outrage, it is difficult to conceive of circumstances in which one man could account for so many victims. Those circumstances alone make it appropriate to set a whole life term. Did you get attacked once in a prison before? Yeah, the broken coffee jar. Yeah, that was well, that practice or whatever. Yeah, it was, yeah. Yeah, it gives them a bit of status, doesn't yeah. it? You know. This is the end. 